Thank you for checking out Lakehead International's videos. You're about to watch one of our Lakehead International live webinars, a fun and informative way to learn more about Lakehead while also meeting faculty, staff, and current students. If you have any questions throughout today's video, please comment below. Otherwise, let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome to another Lakehead International Live. My name is Jordan Ball. I'll be your host today and I'm excited to be joined by a special guest, Dr. Al Resnick, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But first and foremost, I want to thank you for joining us. Whether it's your morning, your afternoon, or your evening, we certainly appreciate your time and we hope you're excited to learn more about medical imaging. That is our sample lecture here today in the International Lecture Showcase. Um, we've been hosting these lecture showcases uh, since last week, and we still have a few more to go, so stay tuned for some exciting news about upcoming events. But without further ado, it's time to introduce Dr. Al Resnick, and I'll pass it over to her to introduce herself. Thank you very much, Jordan. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our session. My name is Al Resnick. I'm a professor in the physics department, and I also hold the position uh, as Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Physics of Radiation Medical Imaging. This means that my research is devoted to the uh, fundamental studies as well as uh, uh, research and development on radiation medical imaging. I have to admit that I am a pure physicist for training. By, uh, by training, uh, I received uh, my uh, both master's degree and PhD degree in solid state physics. However, I devoted my career to the most uh, humane area of application of physics, that is healthcare and medical imaging. So I pass it over to Jordan to start our session. Well, thank you again for joining us. I'm certainly excited to learn more myself and from such an experienced professor of ours. It's time to dive into today's mock lecture and I'll pass it over to Dr. Ala Resnick. Thank you again, Jordan. So give me a second to share my screen. And uh, now we're all set uh, to begin my uh, presentation, which is again titled The Medical Imaging in the Eyes of a, Physi a Physicist, Engineering, or Computer Scientist Student. Um, so uh, first of all, I would like uh, to start with uh, a statement that uh, uh, what uh, you will be um, listening today is uh, very well aligned with Lakehead University vision to, to provide a, trans a transformative university experience that is far from ordinary. And research, uh, which is, uh, mm, I will uh, introduce you to, is uh, the part of this very interesting uh, environment uh, at uh, our university. So Lakehead University is ranked number one um, for undergraduate university for research opportunities. And this is applicable to both, uh, of course, uh, graduate and undergraduate students. Um, another um, important uh, point is that uh, uh, research opportunities in uh, physics, engineering, uh, and uh, other disciplines related to medical imaging is not just the research opportunity. This is uh, uh, normally paid positions or um, uh, scholarships. Uh, if you are enrolled in classes uh, which are relevant uh, to the research I will be talking about, so our classes are normally small, so you can always talk uh, to your course instructor and to understand better what kind of research experience you can get after a particular class. So if we will talk about physics department uh, where I'm from, so we have different streams in our physics program, but one of the interesting uh, um, specialty in our uh, physics department is honor bachelor in physics with major concentration in my biomedical physics. And this uh, uh, program, again, this is uh, physics with major concentration in biomedical physics, provide the roof uh, for the research on medical imaging, uh, uh, which I will be talking uh, to you today. Uh, so uh, why actually it is uh, quite important uh, for uh, students in physics or engineering uh, to be involved in research in medical imaging because this provides a solid foundation for a future career. So um, if you are interested in uh, 
uh, relevant uh, career like uh, um, inter radiation oncologist, uh, interventional oncologist, or just medical imaging scientist, or um, you're interested in working in relevant industry in Canada. So this program and this research is uh, a nice fit uh, for your career goals. So uh, this is really a collaborative degree. We're talking about biomedical physics. This is really a collaborative degree that uh, provides with necessary technical and professional skill set to enter various careers in healthcare, including medicine, medical physics, uh, dentistry, and pharmaceuticals, as I and other disciplines, which I just mentioned, for example, uh, radiation oncology. Uh, in addition to core physics and mathematics, the program offers courses in biology, chemistry, computer science, medical physics, and medical imaging. This not only expand your horizons, but it's also prepare uh, our students for graduate studies uh, in, uh, as I mentioned, physics, uh, health or medical physics, uh, uh, or medical school, and ensures that students develop the multidisciplinary skills valued in healthcare research settings, including industry. So I already mentioned several times medical imaging, and perhaps this is time for us to start to understand what is medical imaging about. Medical imaging is, uh, the, is the technique to create images of a human body for uh, clinical purposes. So we are not making uh, images of human body for just our curiosity, this is unethical, but when we are seeking to reveal, diagnose, or examine diseases, we are making procedure, which is called medical imaging acquisition. And of course, medical imaging is needed for medical sciences, including the study of normal anatomy and physiology. The list of uh, different medical techniques can be made very long. And here I listed uh, some uh, um, imaging techniques which are widely used right now for different diagnosis, pr diagnostic procedures and also to guide interventional procedures. This, uh, this includes X-ray imaging. Uh, X-ray imaging can be roughly divided between radiography, which is static Im uh, X-ray image, or fluoroscopy. This is real-time um, X-ray imaging movie. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI in short, nuclear medicine, computer tomography, ultrasound. These are the most widely used medical imaging techniques today uh, for healthcare. And this is an example. Why do we need uh, medical imaging? So you can see here images of a brain. On the left, you can see an image of a healthy brain. And this is an uh, image of a brain of a patient who complains about memory losses. Memory, loss, uh, memory losses uh, can be um, uh, related uh, to different uh, um, conditions, right? It can be just uh, a normal part of aging, it can be dementia and uh, can be uh, multiple sclerosis. But uh, without uh, imaging, it is very difficult to differentiate uh, uh, just based on a memory loss uh, to come up with a conclusion on a disease. Uh, and uh, imaging is very important because for this particular patient, you can see these plugs in a patient brain, and this is indicative for, for multiple sclerosis. The moment we know uh, what causes a disease, we know how to prescribe a therapy, and this therapy will be much more accurate um, in case um, uh, that in case uh, diagnosis based uh, on medical imaging rather than, for example, in this particular case, if diagnosis is made just on a cognitive uh, um, test, uh, so diagnosis can be much less precise. So why do we need different imaging techniques? Because unfortunately, we are not this guy. So this guy, you may know, this is a Terminator. He doesn't need any imaging technique because he has imaging technique built, uh, built in in his eye. But unfortunately, today we do need a hardware and a software to acquire images and to, uh, to acquire information and to reconstruct image of a patient body or a specific organ. 
So this is a slide of different modalities currently used. I refer to X-ray imaging for laparoscopic procedure. So we already have uh, questions in Q&A session. Per, uh, we um, will uh, uh, reserve them uh, <clears throat> And I will answer questions at the end of my presentation. So uh, this is uh, a photo of uh, what is called fluoroscopy unit. Uh, uh, you can see here ultrasound. Uh, uh, you can see here this is uh, a CT unit. Uh, this is uh, MRI unit. And this is uh, uh, X-ray imaging of a chest, which is radiography static image. But today I will be talking about another technique, which is not listed here. And this technique is for screening for breast cancer. And why I decided to focus on the breast cancer, first of all, because this is integral part of my research and novel technologies for breast cancer diagnosis is uh, a part of my research, but also uh, because of the significance of a clinical task, breast cancer, has quite large incidence today. And one in eight women will develop in the United States and in North America as a whole will develop breast cancer in her lifetime. Uh, like uh, for uh, other types of cancer, if we are able to detect a disease early in its progression, then we can um, prescribe much more efficient therapy. So if we know too little about, about uh, a disease or we detect it too late, this is too bad. Uh, because uh, for breast cancer, we have very good treatment provided we capture early stages of a disease. So what, uh, what uh, are available today in healthcare to screen uh, women for the for breast cancer and screening means that uh, all women because of the high incidence of breast cancer all women after a certain age they are prescribed a procedure which is called x-ray screening of breast with mammography so absolutely all women of above certain age are recommended to have mammography screening so this is a schematic presentation of a mammography screening. Mammography is X-ray procedure. So not the whole patient body is exposed to radiation, just an organ of interest. So you can see uh, that we necessarily need uh, a detector and we need uh, a source of X-ray exposure of X-ray photons, we're physicists, so we have to use a proper terminology. We, we need a source of X-ray radiation or a source of X-ray photons. Uh, the organ is placed between the source of X-rays, which is X-ray tube and detector underneath of a compressed breast. Then we expose breast to radiation and we create what is called projection image of breast structure. Um, X-rays are passing through the breast and uh, the, those of you who took uh, uh, some basic physics courses, you may know that X-rays are attenuated um, in any tissue. The uh, larger the density of a tissue, the larger the attenuation coefficient, the more uh, X-rays are attenuated in dense, uh, in dense tissue. So uh, we normally think that uh, uh, breast tumors have a higher density, and that is why tumors uh, stop or attenuate X-ray at a higher rate than non-cancerous or what is called benign tissue. So let's use also proper terminology. If we are talking about cancer, we are talking about malignant tissue. If we are talking about uh, um, normal tissue, we are talking about benign tissue. So we expect breast tumors uh, to be uh, more dense than surrounding normal tissue. And we can detect high attenuation of for X-ray by uh, dense tumors, and these highly attenuated, attenuated uh, uh, tumors will be highlighted with white color. So you can see something here in this patient breast. So this is a real mammography image. So you have you can see <clears throat> enlarged or uh, larger attenuation in this part of uh, a breast. This can be due to 
uh, tumor, or this can be due to uh, microcalcification from breastfeeding, feeding, or this can be just a normal blunt. And nevertheless, we see something that attenuate X-ray at a higher rate than normal surrounding tissue. So normal tissue is shown in different uh, scale of gray, and highly attenuating tissue is shown as white. Uh, so in mammography, each breast is compressed horizontally, then obliquely, and x-ray is taken of each position to create this projection image of a structure. What is the problem in mammography? I explained to you already that uh, when uh, mm, mm, breast uh, uh, tissue is shown in different scale of gray, so we can see very easily its humor. Uh, because uh, tumor will be shown as white on a gray background. But this is only in case when normal breast tissue has a lower attenuation coefficient for x-ray than uh, surrounding normal tissue. But this happens, unfortunately, only to 50% of all women. For good 50% of all women, even normal breast tissue is very dense. And in this case, cancer is very hard to detect because we can easily detect white on gray, but it's very difficult to, de to detect white on white. So if breast tissue is dense, it is shown as white. And this masks the appearance of uh, um, um, cancerous tumors. So my message uh, or what we can learn from this uh, uh, initial slides that cancer in fatty breast is easy to spot, but it's hard to see cancer in a dense breast because dense tissue and cancer are both shown white on X-ray mammography image. So again, this happened to good 50% of women. And if we can't see the disease, how we can prescribe treatment? So what should we do? What is the solution to this project, to this problem? The solution is a different type of imaging, which is called molecular breast imaging with positron emission tomography. Positron emission tomography does not detect abnormal density of a tumor, but it detects what is called fingerprint of cancer. Fingerprint of cancer is increased glucose metabolism. Cancer is sugar added. It needs more glucose for its abnormal growth. And this is the basis for positron emission tomography. We are using a radioactive analog of a glucose. This is called fluoridoxyglucose. And when we prescribe this fluoridoxyglucose to a patient, this fluoridoxyglucose is attenuated in metabolically active tissue, like brain, for example. Brain needs more glucose or tumors also need more glucose. Let's say that unfortunately this patient has uh, a tumor here. So this radioactive glucose will be accumulated where tumor is located, making tumor more radioactive than surrounding tissue. And then we just need what is called positron emission tomography detectors to detect this abnormal radioactivity from a glucose avid tumors. Positron emission tomography is well-known modality in healthcare. So it is used for different purposes, uh, not only for breast cancer, it mainly used to uh, search for metastasis in case of invasive cancer. However, um, <clears throat> this large and very expensive uh, whole body um, <clears throat> Positron emission tomography or PET in short scanners are only uh, efficient if we do not know where to search, like in case of metastasis. However, if we do know where to search in case of uh, uh, breast cancer, we don't need very expensive machine, and uh, we can use what is called organ targeted machines, and this is exactly a machine which is developed in my group by my uh, graduate and undergraduate students. This is organ-targeted positron emission tomography scanners developed at Lakehead University. Uh, so I just would like to demonstrate to you uh, an efficacy of this technology. So this is our scanner. 
um, patient uh, can be scanned using X-ray mammography and patient can be scanned using the machine, which is called Radialis PET camera. Uh, we commercialize uh, these technologies through spin-off company Radialis. So these are images of the same patient uh, left, uh, left image is X-ray mammography, and right image is uh, image of the same patient with radialis PET camera. This is uh, an example of uh, um, clinical trials. A 56 years old patient uh, has been diagnosed with cancer based on mammography. You can see that it was uh, quite difficult uh, for radiologists to detect that something suspicious sits here, but uh, <clears throat> then it was confirmed with biopsy. This patient has a very dense breast and uh, this patient was uh, already prepared for treatment. However, this patient agreed also to receive another scan with our machine and we identify another lesion, which was absolutely missed with X-ray mammography. And this second cancer was not detected by mammography even in retrospect because this patient unfortunately has very dense breast tissue. So you may see that it is very important to be able to detect cancer based on its inherent property, which is increased glucose metabolism. So just another message, X-ray mammography is very powerful tool for patients who have uh, fatty breast or not dense breast. In this case, mammography can easily detect uh, cancer based on increased density of uh, uh, cancer tumors. However, if patients have dense breast, then uh, the solution to mammography problem is uh, functional or molecular imaging based on increased glucose metabolism of uh, cancerous tumors. So um, this technology can be used for breast or it can be used also uh, for uh, cardiology, for neurology, uh, for other diseases, uh, to detect lymph nodes, uh, to, to detect prostate cancer. So it's very versatile uh, device. And again, it has been developed here at Lakehead University and large group of students were involved. So you can see here uh, the whole history of the development, we started initially with some idea uh, how to make detectors. You can see at that time, my master degree student, Carolyn and Dr. Alexander Buban, at that time he was junior master degree student. We started uh, uh, just to develop this technology from a concept. Uh, then we made a first uh, laboratory prototype. Then we um, <clears throat> patented our technology. We created first uh, clinical prototype, we appeared at different conferences, and finally we incorporated the company and we have a clinical device, uh, which is uh, currently um, under manufacturing with Radialis Medical, and uh, we have clinical trials, uh, sales, uh, and very interesting what is called translational research. Translational means from invention to commercialization, to innovation, because innovation is necessarily um, linked to the incorporation of your innovation into clinical reality. So this is our technology, the technology based on patented uh, sensor. These uh, um, sensors, uh, our know-how is how to assemble a needed area to cover the complete breast using just uh, uh, quite uh, small size sensors, but uh, we can assemble them seamlessly in an array, in a planner detector array, and depending on an application, because we can seamlessly assemble them, like connect them together, we can create uh, what is called field of view or sensing area of a needed size. Um, uh, we have a patent, uh, uh, which uh, actually prevents uh, other people uh, to use our technology. This is also very important. And this patent explains our technology, how we were able to make seamless array out of different sensor models. And of course, before you go to clinic, I don't want to um, bother you with lots of technical details, but before you go to clinic, you have to evaluate your system with a set of tests. And this is what my students do. Uh, they are fully involved in this research and development. So what was the very important part of our technology um, is its super high sensitivity 
to detect small cancers. Uh, again, I don't want to bother you with lots of details, but these are results which my student acquired, and of course they published them. And the two of my students defended their thesis based on a publication in scientific journals. So we compare performance of our system with what is available on market. You can see very important characteristic, which is linked uh, to sensitivity of our detector. This is uh, um, connected to our ability to acquire needed information to create an image. And uh, this is radialis PET camera. Again, I don't want to bother you with lots of numbers, but we have way better efficiency to collect uh, um, <clears throat> an emission from a breast than any other system available on the market or in clinical trials. So if we have a little bit, Jordan, do we have some time? So if, so we have, if we have five minutes, I can show you clinical advantages of our technology. We are running clinical trials right now in the largest uh, cancer care in uh, Canada called the Princess Margaret Health, um, Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. Uh, this is again comparison um, between images acquired with difficult breast dedicated modalities. So you already familiar, I exposed you to x-ray mammography, so you can see an image. So again, these are three images of the same patient, 61 years old uh, patient with multifocal cancer. So we can see quite extensive distortion here on your x-ray image. And this is, of course, uh, some very suspicious results. So it's uh, for radiologists, it was absolutely clear that this is uh, extensive cancer. This patient all also received breast magnetic resonance image here, so breast MRI, and it's very, it shows very large mass uh, in uh, her right breast. What is the problem here? The problem is that imaging detects and diagnosis is based on sampling a tumor so with what is called biopsy, just small pieces of tissues I needed to be taken for um, evaluation under a microscope. And if tumor is very large, uh, physicians do not know which part of a tumor is more, most representative to make a decision about treatment. And when this patient uh, received the scan with our technology, you may see that this large mass is not regular. So it's actually multifocal cancers. We can see this increased contrast in image. And it's very important because now radiologists do know, intervention, interventional radiologists do know that they have to take a piece out of this part rather than in between this foci, because otherwise diagnosis will be not very precise. So these bright um, spots here indicates most representative part of a tumor, which is very important for precision, uh, for precise diagnosis. This is uh, also uh, another um, uh, examples of uh, uh, enhanced uh, uh, contrast in two spots. Uh, so again, very important uh, uh, to um, take uh, a sample out of the most representative part of its humor. And uh, this is a case which is very difficult for me to talk about. Uh, this patient, it's a young patient, 33 years old, high-risk female patient. Uh, uh, this is her... Um, breast MRI. This patient has uh, very dense uh, uh, breast tissue and uh, MRI shows multiple rounded and oval shapes enhancing masses in both breasts. Uh, it's very difficult case uh, for physicians because again, uh, lots of suspicious uh, uh, objects are shown in uh, both breasts, but uh, the problem is where to take a biopsy from. Uh, it's impossible to biopsy every uh, part of a breast. And uh, this patient decided that to avoid the risk of invasive cancer, she uh, will uh, go ahead with uh, bilateral breast surgery. So removal of all breast tissue. This is called mastectomy. Um, she also agreed to make a, a scanning with our machine. And you may see that... Um, our machine didn't uh, 
show any enhancement. Uh, so it's homogeneous uh, uh, image, right? Uh, no any contrast enhancement, but since at this mo moment, uh, uh, our machine was just a research tool, patient uh, it just decided to make mastectomy, but uh, after mastectomy, no malignancy was identified in surgical pathology report. So all these uh, oval shapes were absolutely non-cancerous. They were uh, normal cysts, so this was normal tissue. And uh, this is an example how our technology can not only correct uh, for something that mammography misses, it may also correct for what is called overdiagnosis with breast MRI. Everybody knows about MRI. Everybody knows how MRI is powerful. But unfortunately, for lots of patients, MRI for breast, breast MRI may lead to overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis means finding something that will never lead to cancer. So at this point, I told that, look, uh, our technology is very important uh, to save uh, uh, lives uh, due to the early breast cancer detection, but it's also needed to save breast from MRI overdiagnosis, which maybe is of equal importance. So uh, what we are doing here at Lakehead University, the technology which we develop is very well aligned with current need in medicine. That's why I'm talking about linkage between like my, yeah, you may remember that my yeah, talk uh, was entitled "What uh, um, Physicist or Engineering Student uh, Can Do for Healthcare." We can do devices which are aligned with the trend in personalized medicine, because uh, uh, personal personalized medicine means uh, the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. And this has to be applied for cancer diagnosis as well, for breast cancer diagnosis in particular, because if all patients will receive breast cancer detection with either mammography or breast MRI, we may not benefit a large cohort of patients for whom uh, mammography is not efficient because of dense breast or for whom MRI may produce false positive results and overdiagnosis. So an idea to make different imaging modalities, which will benefit particular groups of patients. So for patients for whom mammography works well, they can still use mammography. Patients for whom um, breast MRI doesn't produce any suspicious but inconclusive results should go ahead uh, with uh, breast MRI, but patients uh, for whom molecular uh, imaging uh, provides most benefit should take uh, uh, an advantage of uh, our developed uh, technology. As you may understand, images which I showed to you as a result of lots of invention in hardware and software, so every image which I show to you is basically a combination of innovation in hardware and software. And this gives uh, a room for physicists, engineers, uh, computer scientists, chemists as well to participate in our research. Thank you very much. And I acknowledge uh, uh, partners uh, for our research, both industry partners and uh, uh, federal and provincial agencies which uh, financially support our research. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I can't say enough about how this research and, and the technology that your team has developed will save lives. I'm, I'm sure of it. And I know through the clinical trials and through your own reporting, uh, you've been able to develop and determine the same. Um, so with that being said, I know that we've had some audience questions. So it is time to open up the Q&A period, as we like to call it. Uh, and go to our audience to see what they're curious to know more about uh, in terms of your research. So the first question is, um, uh, is it possible to detect eyeball movement precisely enough to replace a mouse for a computer input? So I know that that's not tied directly to medical imaging, perhaps, um, but I'm curious. 
<laughs> this is unfortunately not my area of expertise. Uh, this is uh, something I can't uh, reply here professionally. This has nothing to do with medical imaging, but this is very interesting question. And uh, of course, uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, currently this is uh, uh, easy to do, uh, but uh, maybe in the future this would be possible. For sure, yeah. And if we were all the Terminator, I'm sure that we could also control the mouse with our eyes. But for the time being, uh, not quite yet. Another question we have from Alexia says, can you determine how old the damage is from medical imaging? How old? I don't uh, really understand how all the damage is from medical imaging. So, of course, medical imaging, that is why medical imaging is prescribed for the purpose of diagnosis only. So it's uh, any, potentially any imaging can be harmful, right? But uh, there are always, when we are talking about, like any other treatment, uh, like any drugs, right? We always have to consider uh, benefits versus potential harm. But uh, for diagnostic imaging, we use a so small amount of radiation that uh, the risk of uh, uh, harm is uh, much lower than benefits uh, from uh, early diagnosis. So again, this is a good question. We always have to consider benefit to risk uh, uh, ratio. But again, uh, medical imaging is prescribed, prescribed uh, when it is needed so that benefits are much larger than potential harm. For sure. Another question from Katya, it says, how does your new technology get shared in the medical community inside and outside of Canada? So I'm sure you'd be happy to share and speak to what your pathway was to sharing this technology worldwide. Uh, Katya, this is a great question. So when I just uh, started uh, to talk like, uh, like a good 10 years ago, there was a conference uh, in Canada called Alternatives uh, to Mammography, which I attended. And this was a trigger. This was in 95, uh, sorry, it, uh, 2005. And uh, uh, this uh, was a trigger for all our activities. I met the people interested in uh, alternatives to mammography there. And we started our research and it was a collaborative research between uh, two radiologists and myself. So one radiologist was in Toronto, another radiologist was in uh, uh, Maryland, uh, in the States. So um, it uh, ac actually was an uh, international uh, effort. Uh, of course, we are very well connected with medical community inside and outside of Canada. We normally present uh, at uh, conferences uh, uh, conferences relevant uh, to uh, technology development. Uh, the major conference is IEEE, uh, Medical Imaging and uh, Nuclear Sciences Technology Conference. My group uh, normally is uh, presented and represented there uh, quite extensively. Um, in uh, a couple of days on uh, May 15, this, there will be a World Congress on uh, Healthcare in Toronto, and we have uh, two invited talks there. Actually, we will, so my uh, uh, right-hand man, um, Dr. Alexander Buban, with whom we started, you, I showed uh, uh, the history of the development, uh, so he will uh, present an invited talk there, so it will be medical conference. So we are trying to be connected with people who will help us uh, to advance our technology, because there is always room uh, to improvements, right? We can uh, uh, make it uh, more sensitive. Uh, we can make more versatile detector design. So uh, there is lots of ideas uh, how we improve our software and hardware. And uh, we are also trying to be well collected with medical communities uh, by going to different conferences, uh, by uh, um, just uh, making survey here, uh, just raising key opinion leaders so that uh, uh, different medical imaging modalities are needed for precise uh, breast cancer diagnosis or personalized breast cancer diagnosis. Great, thank you. Another question from Lily. It says, what kind of research opportunities related to medical imaging exist for undergraduate students in the biomed physics program? This is an excellent, another excellent question. Thank you for asking. So uh, we are running, today we have an opening for summer school on medical imaging. So uh, since uh, this year, we actually uh, changed the name. It is called the Summer School on Health Technologies. 
So to incorporate the professors in kinesiology, for example, which is not really medical imaging, but it's also technologies for healthcare. Uh, so we provide the paid positions for undergraduate students uh, to um, start to understand what is medical imaging about, because so we uh, we realize that if students will never be involved in uh, research at the undergraduate uh, level, right, it will be very difficult for them to make a decision about graduate studies. So the question is, we have lots of placements, or we have reasonable, let's say we have reasonable amount of placements uh, for summertime to be involved in research in medical imaging and biotechnologies, and uh, this is uh, just uh, uh, beyond uh, medical imaging, but uh, we have medical pure medical imaging research, including X-ray imaging, including uh, molecular imaging, including cyclotron activities, including MRI. Uh, and of course, you have to be, so the competition is uh, significant, but all uh, students with high academic standing. So we normally choose students uh, who excel in their courses and in their studies. They are normally employed during summertime if they're interested uh, to be employed in and uh, to be involved in research in medical imaging or um, health technologies. Great, that ties in nicely to a new question we just received. It said, how do you choose students who do you work with? Is it based on grades? And what do you recommend to students being yes. qualified to participate in research? Is this right. is, yes, this is very accurate statement, uh, Jordan. Yes, because uh, uh, all students uh, deserve to be involved, right? But if you have a high competition, of course, students who put uh, much more effort uh, in their academic uh, part of uh, their life, right? That they have uh, large chance, chances uh, to be selected uh, for some research activities. Good to know. Um, a question from ZA, it says, how do we personalize the medicine to treat the right patients at the right time? Is it something called targeted med drug? That's correct. Uh, so it's uh, there are different approaches. Again, this is not medical imaging. This is normal part of personalized medicine uh, for treatment. Uh, so I was uh, my message was that in addition to personalized treatment, we already we also need personalized diagnosis, and uh, this will complement personalized treatment. But uh, um, if we have personalized diagnosis, this is easier to apply personalized. Uh, uh, drugs, right? Or, of course, uh, so drugs are selected not uh, based uh, on peculiarity of a patient, but based on a cohort of patients. It's maybe some genomic uh, um, evaluation or peculiarity of a disease which group uh, patients, uh, patients in different cohorts, and then a uh, drug is uh, uh, prescribed based on some common features of a certain cohort of patients. And this is applicable to medical imaging as well, because again, an example of breast cancer, so it has to be, patient has to be grouped based on breast density, for example, for those patients who have dense breasts, uh, and we know that mammography is inefficient, then molecular imaging should be prescribed. But for patients uh, for whom mammography works well, there is no any need to prescribe any other type of uh, diagnostic imaging. So this is normally uh, in a precision or personalized treatment or diagnosis, patients are grouped based on some peculiarities of specific groups. Right, and even reflecting on your own presentation where you showed us an example of a a patient that had multifocal cancer. Multifocal uh, cancer, for example. Exactly. So they had personalized uh, treatment and they were able to be diagnosed because rather than exactly. uh, when a biopsy was taking place to go into the middle of what you would have assumed was the mass, was I'm actually multiple spots. You got it exactly. It mm -hmm. is. So in order to prescribe personalized treatment, it can be chemotherapy, it can be radiation therapy. They need to take a biopsy from the most representative part of the tumor. So this, uh, this links us uh, to the precise uh, pre need for a precision diagnosis. This next question from Gabriella is, are there any risks or side effects with different types of medical imaging? Thank you, Gabriela. I already started to answer this question. There are always risks of different types of medical imaging. So there is nothing that is absolutely risk-free. 
Uh, but uh, um, if you are thinking about radiation induced uh, side effects, right? So uh, for the amount of radiation which is used in diagnostic imaging, uh, the risk is minimal. I can't say that the risk is zero, but as I mentioned, the benefits of uh, early diagnosis are way more important than the risk of exposure to small amount of radiation. We always are exposed to radiation. We're exposed to just cosmic radiation. We're exposed to sun radiation. We fly overseas where uh, exposure to cosmic radiation is larger because of the elevation. We should not be uh, paranoid about radiation. So radiation in a small amount is not harmful but it is not absolutely risk-free. And there are cases of radiation-induced cancers and they're very well uh, known, right? But these are rare cases. And uh, of course, uh, in, for general public, uh, the risk of radiation-induced uh, cancer from the exposure during diagnostic procedure is really minimal and uh, um, benefits are much more significant. This ties nicely into a question that I came up with personally, where I've had x-rays before, and I, I always question, what is the, the heavy gown or, or coat that they put on when they're doing sort of scans? I would imagine that it protects you from that radiation, but could you explain to the audience what, exactly. what that is? This, exactly. is? this is a great question, but you may imagine that patients come and go. And for patient procedure lasts for one minute and technologist is there or radiation oncologist is there all the time. And they do not receive direct radiation, but they receive scattered radiation because radiation, uh, uh, the um, gamma photons, they experience all kinds of passages inside the, the uh, treatment or diagnosis room. So we have scattered radiation and this radiation bounced uh, onto a technology, techno body of a technologist. And they're there uh, seven hours uh, per day, right? Not just one minute uh, as uh, uh, patients. So accumulated dose is way larger and radiation protection for um, for technologies uh, is very important thing. And uh, when we expose just a particular organ to radiation, there is no any reason to expose the whole body, right? We always have to protect our body from radiation. We have to use uh, uh, sunscreen lotion, right? Uh, because we have to be reasonable. But uh, then we have to protect. But if radiation is needed for diagnosis, we should not be paranoid about radiation. Right. So one of the, the last questions we have so far is from Martin. It says, are there any cases where PET scans might have an, a disadvantage to other method, methods such as MRI or X-ray? This is also a great question. So um, first of all, disadvantages is uh, the cost of uh, every procedure. That is why we have uh, for patients, this is discomfort patients have to go to. So it's not just in one day. Yeah, so patients have uh, to go to a clinic's wait, right? So this is uh, uh, every time uh, you have extra scan, you worry about results. Uh, so there are also psychological effects. Uh, particular harm from a procedure is much, so it's not just a harm like some um, or radiation induced or things like that. This is, uh, you have uh, to uh, imagine a complete story. And of course, each scan is, uh, even if it is covered by insurance, so this is costly to our healthcare. That is why we have to be selective. We should not uh, trigger. So every a result which is suspicious but inconclusive trigger a whole battery of tests, which is psychologically difficult for patient to handle, uh, which is costly to our healthcare. That's why we need to, to be much more precise in everything we are doing. However, uh, just uh, there is no like healthcare, direct healthcare harm from a procedure. I would say that it's uh, almost zero, but uh, if uh, we consider extra uh, diagnostic tests in a much larger picture, we should understand that uh, it is better to avoid. So unneeded tests have to be avoided. And unneeded or unnecessary biopsies have to be avoided as well. Great, thank you for answering that. 
So that looks like uh, we've answered all of the questions so far today. Uh, I want to take this opportunity for thanking you for joining us, Dr. Resnick, and sharing more about medical imaging and the impact it has on patient care, but also the impact of, of our own students and their ability to participate in this research uh, and perhaps where that may take them in the future. Before I let everyone go, I want to remind you to follow us on our social media channels. You can find us at Lakehead International on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you want to explore our campuses, our, our labs, our lecture halls, our facilities in general, you're more than welcome to do that from the comfort of your own home on a virtual campus tour. Head over to lakehead.ca forward slash tours. If you want to check out some of our other upcoming events, um, including other uh, lecture showcases, um, exploring immigration needs, residents on campus, all that sort of stuff. You can scan the QR code on your screen and uh, register today. Thank you again so much for joining us, folks. It's been a pleasure to be your host. And thank you one last time to Dr. Resnick for joining us. I know it's a busy time of the year. And I mean, quite frankly, you're always busy with your research. And uh, we certainly appreciate your time joining us today. Uh, with that being said, though, hopefully we'll uh, see everyone again shortly at one of our upcoming events. Otherwise, I'll wrap it up here and say bye for now. Bye for now. And thank you, Jordan. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to everybody. Bye bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, I want to encourage you to comment below or connect with us on social media. We can be found at Lakehead International on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Thanks for watching once again, and hopefully we'll see you at the next live webinar. Bye for now.